Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Ryan Davis, and I am a junior studying economics at the college, and I'm a member of the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park and JF JFK street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag crisisforum, which is also listed in your programs. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guests, Chef Jose Andres, Jason Jackson, Secretary Jay Johnson, Brad Kaiserman, and tonight's moderator, Juliette Kayam. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Juliette Kayyem. I'm the faculty chair, and I think that's me, not turned off, I apologize, of the Homeland Security Program uh, here at uh, the Kennedy School of Government. Uh, so when we were thinking about uh, a panel like this, obviously looking back at what happened in 2017, uh, in particular with natural disasters, how we might begin to think about 2018, because what we do know for sure is uh, this, this issue is not going away. Uh, to give you a little bit of flavor of hurricane season 2017, um, Hurricane Harvey in the Texas area, category four, anywhere from 130 to 156 miles per hour, August 17th to September 2nd, damage 125 billion, fatalities 82. Uh, then Hurricane Irma, uh, almost uh, at about the same time, Category 5 of over 157 miles per hour, um, damage 64 billion and fatalities 134. And then, of course, Hurricane Maria, Category 5, hitting at about September 16th, damage $91.6 billion and fatalities of what we know 547. Many of you are aware that we don't have a direct uh, fatality rate in Puerto Rico. By far, it was the costliest season on record with a preliminary total of approximately 281 billion in, in US in damages, US dollars, which is about 100 billion higher than the total of the, two, of a, of the season 10 years earlier. Um, I did not include Hurricane Nate and some other hurricanes, the wildfires and other uh, issues that were impacting emergency management and disaster management. So that's a snapshot, uh, but does not give you the flavor or the contours or the challenges as we clearly know of what happened in 2017. So we are, I am very grateful as is the school uh, that we have such a wonderful uh, panel. Um, I'm gonna begin on my far left and then I'm just gonna do a moderated discussion. Uh, the first is Secretary Jay Johnson, the Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security from 2013 to 2017. He is a senior fellow, which I'm very grateful for, at the Homeland Security Project at the Belfer Center here and a partner at Paul Weiss um, Law Firm. <laughs> Next to him is Jason Jackson, a long and distinguished career in emergency management and now the Senior Director of Emergency Management at Walmart. Uh, next to him, oh, you guys switched, hi. I'm glad <laughs> Brad, Brad, Brad Kaiserman, Vice President of Disaster Operations and Logistics at the Red Cross and uh, Brad and I worked together when he was at FEMA. And then the man who needs uh, no introduction, Chef Jose Andres, uh, international, do you wanna hear my bio for you? Internationally recognized <laughs> culinary innovator, author, educator, humanitarian, chairman, uh, I'll stop there. Chef and owner of Think Food Group and someone whose name and his activities uh, during um, and for Puerto Rico are uh, globally recognized. And I think uh, uh, there are many people, I, got a, I tweeted out uh, a picture of us just now and I got people from Puerto Rico who must follow you who are already saying, can you please tell him thank you. Um, so part of what this discussion will be also is really about how disaster response today is really not, a not just a governmental effort. So I want to explore that first issue uh, with the person who ran the Department of Homeland Security and the expectations on government to deliver 
in a crisis or a disaster. The problem is a disaster is called a disaster for a reason. It's horrible. People are dying, property is damaged. And so how did you think about sort of uh, both satisfying public expectations, but also knowing when you had to reach outside government resources to engage others to help? Juliet, um, I was secretary for three years and during that time, and long before I got there, um, FEMA came a long way after Katrina mm -hmm. in 2005 um, to the agency it is today. And I give a lot of credit to Craig Fugate for that, for really building and rebuilding that agency after, after Katrina occurred. Uh, when I was secretary, relatively speaking, uh, we did not have the, some of the major disasters that we saw in 2017. 2017 was literally the perfect storm between Harvey, Irma, Nate, Maria, the wildfires in Northern California, the mudslides. And that obviously stretched government resources. Uh, it stretched the disaster relief fund, it stretched the funding for resources, it stretched person power, and therefore <clears throat> it is incumbent upon, even in ordinary times, and I saw this when I would visit disaster relief scenes, mudslides, floods, tornadoes, it's incumbent upon FEMA and state disaster response to rely also upon organizations like the American Red Cross the Small Business Administration, the SBA has a role in disaster response, as well as volunteerism and the private sector and the goodwill and big hearts of people like Chef Andrus and the, the, the hundreds and thousands of volunteers that we would see and organizations like Walmart. And so I th in any time I would visit a disaster <coughs> relief scene, I was you know, saddened and depressed by the tragedy, people losing their homes, people losing family, but came away heartened by the spirit of volunteerism that I would see, much of which is reflected right here on this stage. Disasters really do bring out the best in people. People are willing to help their neighbors, people are willing to help you know, others they don't even know. And so invariably, a disaster response is a collective effort among a lot of different actors and, and agencies. And hopefully there's somebody there to coordinate it all. Uh, sometimes there is not. And very definitely 2017 presented a challenge for government in responding to disasters specifically in Puerto Rico. So Brad, I wanna I'm going to get back to the secretary on that, but Brad, you, you went from FEMA to the Red Cross, and Red Cross is not without uh, complaints about it, about its delivery of service, um, uh, its capacity to respond, but it also has a unique function in disasters, which it actually takes on the sheltering role for housing and sheltering role for, um, uh, uh, for the government. Uh, but this issue of readiness, right, this idea that we have to be ready given, the, given what happened but also what's about to happen in terms of climate change <coughs> and hurricanes, help people understand, how, how do you even uh, conceive of readiness given what just happened and what is clearly going to happen in the years to come if you believe the science, which we do here? So, so I, think that, uh, I think first and foremost is, is recognizing this. Um, you began with it. You said the reason it's called a disaster, right? Yeah. So the reason that disasters are disasters is because the very, the, the needs are out, there's not enough resource to meet the needs. That's the definition of disaster. And since we're at Harvard, if you look at the literature, you're going to see that the literature really backs that up. But what's the definition of a catastrophe? And the definition of a catastrophe is when the very event you're responding to destroys the resources or eviscerates the resources that you need to respond. And that is what happened to us in Harvey. Mm. That is what happened to us, and I talk about us, I'm talking about the community that the secretary referred to. Because disaster response isn't any one single responsibility. So when we talk about readiness, what are we getting ready for? 
We're, we need to be ready for a couple of things. One, the infrastructure is aging. You don't have to go any further than the dam in Oroville or the water situation in Flint to recognize that's going to be a continued problem. Second, the threats are more aggressive. By that I mean that they're coming faster, they're bigger, we see these more extreme weather events and they're happening quicker. Um, it, it was, uh, this summer was Harvey, then Irma, mm. then Maria, then Hurricane Nate, then the worst shooting in the history of the United States in Las Vegas, which many, many of us were involved in the response to, and then the fires in Northern California, and the wildfires in Southern California, respectively the first and second worst fires in the history of the state of California, and most deadly. And then there was the mudslides. Mm. By the way, the mudslides were a few weeks ago. We're still in this, nothing stopped. So what do we have to be ready for? We have to be ready for an aging population, aging infrastructure, a much more aggressive threat, and a very asymmetric threat, by which I mean we're gonna continue to need the sorts of resources that aren't really designed to fit the requirement, which is, we'll pivot to Chef here in a minute, that's precisely what, what uh, Chef and his team are bringing to the table, no pun intended. So I think when we talk about readiness, it really is do we have people who are trained and available in the community, not just on our worst day, but every day? Do we have the supplies that are necessary to respond? If you ask me what my major lesson learned in 2017 was, my top three lessons, logistics, 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 yeah. right? And then finally, you know, do you have the, the support in the community in which you need to operate? Because if the community is not supporting the team, and I mean whether it's FEMA, the Southern Baptists, the SBA, uh, I I individual, uh, <coughs> individuals who are volunteering, it doesn't matter. The fe if the community doesn't support that, we are not going to be ready to respond because it takes so long to get organized that without that support. So that's what we need to be ready for. And that's what I see us you know, focusing on going forward. So picking up on that, Jason, um, you work for a rather large company with, which does uh, supply chain logistics pretty well um, in the sense of uh, on, a, on a good day, on a sunny day. Uh, can you, but Walmart isn't the government. I mean, in other words, and can, so can you help us understand sort of where is Walmart's strength in this, but where is also your weakness? And maybe just first describe what do you actually, you know, what does Walmart do in a disaster? Those of us who study disasters know what you do, but maybe explain sure. how, do you, uh, how do you come in and, how do you, and when do you decide to come in? Sure, so it, it really starts for us um, with our associates. Um, Walmart obviously uh, has a large footprint across mm -hmm. the globe, um, but specifically in the United States, um, over 5,000 facilities under over 1.4 million associates that work for us. Um, and that represents pretty much every corner of the United States, Puerto Rico, um, and so with that, anytime there is an environmental impact like a natural disaster at the Las Vegas shooting, um, it impacts us. Um, and so there's an opportunity, number one, to take care of our associates, uh, and we have a responsibility to do that, and that's really kind of what was the genesis of all of this. Um, the second is, is to get our operations back up and running. Uh, and so um, the best way we, we believe that we can support a community is through what we do every single day, which is move stuff from one place to another uh, and put it onto a shelf. Um, sometimes in the case of donations, um, we can just move stuff from one place to another uh, and give it to a, a shelter or give it to a, another organization that's going to use it to their benefit. Um, but the third piece is, is really that community <coughs> aspect of it and how can we support the people that take care of us every day. Um, so when we do that, we have, a like, like other companies, um, a 24-7 operation in terms of identifying hazards and global events that are out there that assess and triage. Um, and then as we are determining you know, what the level of impact is to us and to the community, uh, we make determinations on how we're going to respond. And can I just follow up on this just to drill down? Just he, didn't, he didn't say this, but he is essentially Walmart's FEMA. Yeah. Uh, Walmart is bigger than some state governments. He's essentially their FEMA. So, and just to explain, are you, when you, are you moving stuff, just to, just to help, for people don't, just describe sort of what Walmart did in Katrina, for example, where the government could not satisfy something. <coughs> just a quick overview, just because I think it's... Sure, and I'm always um, really careful when we say that because everybody has a role. Yeah. Uh, and I have this really strong belief that it takes the, we said this before in the, in the, we came out here too, is it takes the government, it takes the NGOs, the volunteer organizations and the private sector all to work together to make communities more resilient and to recover post-disaster. Um, so if you go back to Hurricane Katrina, um, it was nearly 5,000 truckloads of stuff 
uh, but water and food and um, recovery items, whether it was cleaning supplies or tarps or whatever it might take for a community to recover, that we were moving into the area. Uh, the thing that we learned from then to now, I think, uh, really is better coordination with all of those partner groups that we just talked about. We talked to other companies. Um, we partner with other companies. We partner with uh, the Red Cross was, was out at, at, at your headquarters not too long back talking about how do we do this better together, um, working with the FEMA partners uh, to do exactly the same, but um, we are getting more coordinated and that's where it needs to go. You asked the question about readiness earlier yeah. and I'll take it on a little bit of a dig different tangent for you. Um, for us, readiness starts with learning um, and kind of going through and we did a deep after action mm -hmm. ourselves within our own company. Uh, around how can we get better, what did we learn, where do we make mistakes, uh, where, where, do we, where were we strong, and what, what should we keep doing. Uh, but really in terms of um, where things are going, um, data. How do we share data? Um, how do we get faster, more accurate data um, and use analytics to help us be better at what we do and faster? Um, you talked about some of the um, changes in the infrastructures that are out there and not just aging, uh, but we've also moved to streamline, right? So you have just-in-time supply chains. No longer are there warehouses just yeah. full of uh, stuff out there. Um, so how do you move it in, in times of need when you have this surge demand um, so that you can not only support that population, but everybody <coughs> else as well? We have time for a 45-second Walmart story? Yes. Relevant? <laughs> so uh, in Hurricane Harvey, so we can move past Katrina, in Hurricane Harvey just now, uh, in, uh, in August, September, and October, um, we, uh, we had to open shelters. We had a peak shelter population <coughs> in of over 43,000 people in one night. That overlapped with the shelter population in Florida for Irma. And so on one night, somewhere in September, we had a shelter population of 330,000 people across three states. That is a population the size of the city of Pittsburgh. Had to very quickly open up mega shelters, huge shelters. Walmart came in, they opened up a pop-up store. Not that anybody was paying for anything, it was the distribution of supplies, but not just relief supplies, but it was the things that people needed, it was it, uh, strollers for toddlers, everything that people had lost in their homes, clothes. People were being rescued and literally dropped at a shelter, soaking wet from the Coast Guard helicopter that just plucked them off the roof. And so Walmart was there, and not just was Walmart there. By the way, I'm not a paid advertisement for Walmart. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really not. I, uh, it's, it's just, we've been together, we've been doing this work, and, and it changed the dynamic because of that contribution. And it wasn't just a monetary contribution. And, and you asked the why, though, and, and I think that there's this, uh, I mean, Walmart, I think people look at it and go, well, it's just a big company, it's a corporation, mm -hmm. um, but there's a heart, right? There's people that work in this corporation. Yep. The, the lady that, that came yep. to, your, to that shelter we're talking about uh, in Houston um, was actually one of our distribution center managers. Uh, she's an immigrant uh, mm -hmm. to the United States. She worked herself up and she's, she is one of our most fantastic distribution center managers. She volunteered to go to leave her family, go to Houston, yep. and help run logistics on all of that, all those items that were coming in. And when we asked her why she wanted to do it, she, and she was most recently naturalized, it, she, we asked her why, she said, because I want to do something good for my country. That's the why behind it, and that's what people, cor people are made up of corporations and. Right, so Chef, I want to get to you, because there was, uh, you describe yourself as a relief tourist. In other words, uh, <laughs> the Puerto Rico was not your first hurricane, um, nor um, what you did in terms of food distribution. Um, it would be nice to say that the story of Puerto Rico was government unable to function. That's, I think, the best view of it. Uh, but there was also contracts made uh, that shouldn't have been made uh, uh, for electricity. The story today in the New York Times, FEMA contract called for 30 million meals for Puerto Ricans, only 50,000 were delivered. It's those mistakes or that lack of capacity that uh, um, you saw that lane that needed to be filled um, at that stage. And so I'm curious both, is the model that you, describe what you did in Puerto Rico and is that sustainable or is that only, you know, can you do it again and again, given what everyone is saying, what we should anticipate in 2019 or 2018? I don't think we have enough time, but I'm writing a book. Please buy it when it's <laughs> there. <laughs> and many of these answers will be delivered. You know, I began kind of getting active uh, on, on this front after uh, the, hurric uh, the earthquake in, in Haiti. Mm. And I kept going to different events, uh, uh, mainly as uh, to observe, to learn. 
to listen uh, and obviously uh, slowly helping and every time doing more and more meals. So I just came back from, from Ventura where mm -hmm. we kind of put an end to the operations there, which we had a great partnership with Red Cross where I think World Central Kitchen, we did more than 50,000 meals between the shelters run by Red Cross and firefighters that they were not getting for some reason food or the National Guard that for some reason nobody provides food or water to them. So if we go to Puerto Rico, this is the situation. I tell my wife, I'm going Monday, <laughs> first plane uh, I could get in, and I'll be back by Saturday, maybe Sunday. Thursday, I receive a, a visit from Salvation Army. To me, Salvation Army is a very big NGO that is supposed to be there next to Red Cross to provide food to Americans in need. And the person from Salvation Army, the, the, what they call the Grand Marshal, the person in relief in an operation, <coughs> requests 250 meals for a uh, shelter. And he arrives and, hey, do you know where this chef operation is? We were already cooking four days in a little kitchen in the middle of San Juan. So yeah, it's here, but we are closed now. It's 8 p.m. Like, man, I was looking for 250 of anything. Like, ah, you want sandwiches? Because we already <laughs> had preparation for next morning. So I say, yeah, I give you 250 sandwiches. Do you want fruit? I say, you have fresh fruit? I say, sure, <laughs> plenty. Here, you have 500 apples. Do you need water? Like, you have water too? I say, no problem. How many bottles do you want? 250. That night, I called my wife, and I told my wife, I don't think I'm coming back. Mm. For some reason, they invite me to FEMA, uh, to what they call the Masker. Uh, and they know better than me. And Masker, which mm, roughly was in 2012, there was a partnership between Red Cross and FEMA that was created precisely to provide food aid to Americans in need after this type of disasters. And I was invited to the meeting, kind of informally. I was not supposed to be there, but uh, at that day we were already doing roughly 20,000 meals a day. Um, in that meeting I saw very clear when I left that actually was not the plan to take care of Puerto Rico. Why I'm saying this? The disaster in Puerto Rico was not like any disaster we've seen before. Even the earthquake in Haiti, as massive as it was, was centralized. Massive in the number mm -hmm. of people that died. We're talking about the entire island that had no electricity. But we need to go through the process, OK? That means that hospitals had no food for the nurses and the doctors working 24-7. The first people came to ask us for food were the nurses and the doctors. Mm -hmm. We began feeding almost every hospital in the city. Why? Because if the doctors had money in the bank, the ATMs were not ready because the banks were shut down. If they had a car that they could go somewhere for food, probably they would not have gas because the gas ran out because the pumps were not working because there was no electricity. The phones were not working. The mess that the entire Puerto Rico was on was really of biblical pro proportions. So when I say that we began cooking because we saw the problem, Monday we did 2,000 meals right after we landed. By Sunday we were doing 25, 30,000 meals a day. By that time we had two kitchens. We began with 20 brothers, cooks, that all came. We were in a restaurant that the ceiling was water falling every time rain began. But we activated that restaurant. We activated the parking lot in front of. We activated 10 food trucks. And by Sunday I realized that the problem was so big that we needed an entire plan to feed the island. Mm -hmm. So in the next two weeks, we were able to open, in the next three weeks, we were able to open 18 kitchens, 14th in the perimeter, four in the heart of the island. We reach a tip of 175,000 meals a day. Um, we got more than 19,000 volunteers. And to this day, we did 3.3 million meals, roughly, between sandwiches and hot meals, 70% hot meals, 30%. What I saw in this was that if an NGO that was not supposed to be there, my NGO was Central Kitchen. When we arrived there, we had two people on payroll. Me, I'm, I'm just the funding and the chairman, but I'm not on payroll. I have <laughs> nothing to do in the day-to-day. -day. When we saw the need, we began doing this. 
we need to cook and we need to feed. So what we did was use go around the island, take a look at the kitchens. Intelligence is key. One of the problems I believe FEMA has uh, as, a, as a government, the people are amazing, is that everybody goes into those big headquarters and nobody goes out. Mm. So for me, it's almost impossible to take care of a, of a disaster if you know what the disaster is all about. And so everybody's in the building. I requested FEMA, I remember Friday, that's in Friday I requested, they told me, Jose, can you help us with sandwiches? I said, yeah, let's do a quarter million sandwiches. Hmm. And because they say, well, we cannot give you money because you are not a contractor of ours. I'm like, what is a contractor? I, <laughs> I only want food and money to keep feeding. So I told them, this is the least to do a quarter million sandwiches. I gave it to FEMA, I gave it to people of Red Cross, all the people were there. And to this day, I'm still waiting, even when they told me in an email, <laughs> don't worry, Jose, the sandwiches are coming. <laughs> they ordered them to Florida. Mm -hmm. The ports are in chaos. In the process, what I did, I activated the four bakeries were in the island. We helped them with fuel, bribing with food <coughs> to the people control the fuel. And all of a sudden, we were able to activate the bakeries that were in Puerto Rico. All of a sudden, we had bread. All of a sudden, th thanks to Walmart, I broke the rules. They gave me $50,000. <laughs> and they told me that we couldn't be using it in their stores. Well, they were the only ones that had food, so we used to go to Sam's Club through the back <laughs> and spend the money even they told us we couldn't. You see, we kept adapting. So I repeat, an NGO like ours, what we show is that when we say emergency, chances are that it's never going to be two emergencies equal. Mm -hmm. So we need to be bringing the word adaptation. We are always going to have to adapt to the needs. Was food in the island? Plenty. The private sector worked like no private sector works. They were full of food, of cans, of chicken, of rice, of beans. What we had was kitchens. We make sure that those kitchens were operational. We provide everything every kitchen needed, from fuel to diesel to generators. We began, I call, I got 26 of the best head chefs of America in arenas, in convention centers. We created Delta Force units. They began going kitchen to kitchen around the island. In the process, we began solving a problem. Less meetings and more acting is sometimes mm -hmm. what we need in those emergencies. That's kind of what I saw initially. So when you, I just want to follow up on Puerto Rico. At some state, if it's Puerto, Rico, Puerto Rico, the crisis is still ongoing. I mean, in terms of the, you can barely talk about building mm -hmm. better, more resilient, as people are still waiting for electricity. But when you talk about adaptation, can you describe sort of when you're in the middle of it, because all of us have worked disaster management, uh, what was that greatest adaptation in Puerto Rico? When you're there and you're just like, what is the thing you learn the most that can help people in the, in the hurricanes ahead that well, you had to adapt to? Well, uh, adaptation was, were things like very quickly, um, listen, the people of the federal government Every one of them is unbelievable. So I needed to deliver sandwiches to the top mountains of the heart of the island because we knew nobody was getting there yet. And Homeland Security sent 80, 100 men and women of a unit called HSI within ICE, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And they were amazing. And I met them at the bar of the hotel. <laughs> when you want things to happen in emergencies, <laughs> go to the bar of some hotels. <laughs> <laughs> Forget to go to headquarters, go to the bar of the hotels. <laughs> and I was able to meet the person in charge of that unit. And I met them because they told me that they were trying to put uh, people, uh, all the people that they were missing action around the island, to try to put them in contact with their family members in homeland, in the States. And I had a Puerto Rican friend who had a 96-year-old who didn't know who he was in the other part of the island in a town called Añasco. I was able to get their help. Two days later, they were able to put the friend of my wife with his 96-year-old mm -hmm. father. Amazing people. But in the process, the guys told me, Jose, you, you are the cook, right? Yeah, I said, listen, we're going all around the island, and we go empty-handed. We are going everywhere to the 78 municipalities. It would be great if we could bring some food. I'm like, OK, how many sandwiches do you want? I said, well, we have 40 jeeps. Uh, you know, let's see how many we can fit. So I remember still the, that Thursday that they were all aligned, like it was a movie, the 40 jeeps, 7 a.m., 
<laughs> all our volunteers filling up the back of their jeeps with fruit, water, and sandwiches. And they went. 100 days later, every morning, we will keep doing exactly the same. <laughs> Those guys of Homeland Security alone delivered hundreds of thousands of sandwiches to the most remote areas. That was adaptation to the need. Why? Because one of the things I requested, even you know, watching how well you, you work in emergencies in Sandy and that in, in America, here in, in the Homeland, uh, you have the Red Cross delivery trucks. Mm -hmm. And I asked, where are the delivery trucks? And they told me, here, Jose, the operation is different. We don't have delivery trucks. Right. So we had to adapt. I needed delivery trucks because we had no gas, no fuel. A lot of people were running low on money even to buy fuel. Even people wanted to volunteer. So I was trying to use any, any form to deliver. Those men of the HSI within Homeland Security yeah. helped mm -hmm. us to start delivering very quickly to areas that nobody was even still uh, show up two, three weeks later. Mm. So that was a simple uh, example of adaptation of, of many other things that happened. That's great. Ch oh, so Secretary, sorry. My observation ask you about Puerto Rico as a private citizen out of office was that it was the confluence of several really bad circumstances. One, it came immediately after Harvey, uh, Irma, mm -hmm. uh, um, yes. Nate, um, right in that pipeline, and so by September 20th, when Maria hit, resources were already stretched, and people's attention, political, public, was diverted. So that's number one. Number two is Puerto Rico is part of the United States, but it's remote. It is literally offshore, though it is part of the United States. It's not part of the continental United States. It's remote. Three, the lack of the same level of disaster response resources at the state level, like Texas and Florida have, which are enormous in Texas and Florida. And <clears throat> four, the, it didn't get the same level of press and political attention that it should have, um, like the earlier hurricanes and disasters. And you put all that together, and you have the circumstances that we see here, and fortunately, you have people uh, like the people up here who, who stepped in, but it was the confluence of a number of really, really bad things. I would just add to that, the, the, just a, the other point I think is Puerto Rico had, and I'm, I'm not trying to beat a drum, but I think it's important, Puerto Rico had a very degraded electrical infrastructure before Maria ever struck. That was a very well-known fact to government, the private sector, and everyone else, and I'll tell you the number one thing that you have to deal with in any disaster is power restoration. If you cannot get the lights back on, you can chef hit on a number of things. You can't pump gas. Um, you, you, you people have security issues. Um, it becomes difficult for yep. people who are in hospitals. I mean, we're still, we're, we're, we just got, uh, from the competitors, sorry, we just got uh, generators from Harbor Freight, you know, uh, another <coughs> large company. We've got 500 generators that we're delivering around for people who have dialysis machines or they have oxygen converters uh, or they have other needs. If you can't get the power back on, you can't get power. Uh, I agree, but uh, let me give you an example for, for us to understand what I believe the 21st century mm -hmm. uh, America way of providing help, especially FEMA, especially the big NGOs, and hopefully in partnership with the smaller ones. Electricity, right? It's something called the ejidas, which are the retirement for older people. Some are private, some are semi-private, some are public. And many ejidas, they were 12, 14, 16 floors high. Are you with me? No elevators, are you with right. me? 70, 80, 90 year old. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. All the kitchens are electrical. You follow me? <laughs> they couldn't cook in the kitchens. Right. We were giving them, and I say we as Americans through the different agencies, rice and beans. Who was the clever person that decided to give rice and beans to people with electric kitchens? <laughs> And on top of that, because they are government-run buildings, they don't allow them to do, let's say, uh, open fire. Because it's, and nobody broke the rules, because they will kick everybody out. So if we give them rice and beans, if you are counting like, hey, it's not true, we are giving them food. But then when you go to them and say, hey, Jose, here, take all these beans and rice, take it with you. 
And that's what we did very often. We took with us back because people were so happy that we were bringing them cooked food. So this is the kind of things that they see minimal, insignificant, but obviously you see that somebody is not really thinking about those details that can be the difference between life and death. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So it's very important that really we put a big thought through on those details because will be how effectively we will keep providing. You know, when after Katrina, which unfortunately I was not there and I wish I was there, but I read and I read and we said that many of the things that happened will never ever happen again. And I think we are all together gonna have to come to terms of understanding what really we have to do to make sure that this will never ever happen again and how do we start adapting and how we start bringing new players mm -hmm. That can, you know, I do believe football teams, they have special teams. Mm -hmm. I want to be the special teams for feeding America. Not me, my entire profession. So when you don't have any cook in the table of where to and how to feed people, chances are you're going to miss opportunities. National Guard in Puerto Rico, we were feeding the National Guard because they didn't have food. They didn't even got emeries with them because they were at the port. And the main guy told me, Jose, where are you getting the food? I'm like, in the shop. <laughs> so what I mean is we need intelligence. And I understand that the guy in the military doesn't know where the shop is. But the cook knows. <laughs> it takes me 10 minutes to know where the bakeries are, who are the big food companies, and what's the situation of the food in the island. So we need to sometimes to go back to the basics. Don't make things that are simple overcomplicated. And start thinking about details like, if people have no water and no electricity, please don't give them raw beans and rice because they don't taste good like that. <laughs> I mean, the one, it's an amazing point because when I think the way we had thought about disasters and the way the government had structured itself was under the assumption that disasters were both random and rare. Right, this idea that uh, you know, government, we paid money for disaster relief as a country because uh, you know, there but for the grace of God go I. Well, you can't say that anymore. They're neither random nor rare. And the way we, you know, the, the way you're describing them would suggest that the government's role actually, we have to more think about disaster management as more distributive, that it's more like a, people are fitting in a puzzle piece. But uh, the thing I want to get back to the secretary ab uh, about then is um, that lets government off the hook a little bit. I mean, in other words, you, you explained what happened in Puerto Rico. Um, and I think for many of us who are watching and who are sympathetic to the government because we had worked in it, um, you know, the idea that because Puerto Rico is an island, you know, it's been an island forever, right? I mean, in other words, in terms of the training yeah. and what the expectations are. So I'm trying to, I'm sort of struggling with sort of what, what can we, what should we expect or demand of government given disasters no longer random and rare? Um, and then I'll get to the three of you about fin filling well, in the answer is easy. I mean, uh, you treat everybody in the United States the same. <laughs> um, it's an island, it's not an excuse. Uh, it's an explanation for why in the mindset of certain government decision makers, some of whom might not even know that Puerto Rico is part of the United States, yeah. um, it's not top of the list like Texas. Puerto Rico doesn't have a delegation of 29 House members, yeah. many of whom are on appropriations committees, or Florida with 20-some House members and two senators. And so... <clears throat> And coming at the end of the pipeline of a lot of natural disasters, it got overlooked, coupled with the infrastructure, coupled with the lack of, of resources, coupled with the fragility of you know, their electrical yeah. supply, and the, and, it, and the fact that it's an island and you need to bring supplies into ports. You put it all together and you have the disaster that we had at a, at a sustained level. And in every one of these, whether it's a natural disaster, a cyber attack, a terrorist attack, um, yeah. a surge at the southern border, there are lessons to be learned. And everyone needs to learn the lessons, but what I used to always tell my people is, you gotta, you gotta prepare 
and learn from the last disaster, but you also have to prepare for the next one that is unanticipated. Mm -hmm. And try to imagine the next one, stay a step ahead. Did you, so, is it, just I wanna ask you, like, this seems, um, is it sustainable? I mean, in other words, when you look at climate change and you look at these hurricanes one after the other, and we're not talking about other natural disasters, uh, not is it sustainable, how would you sustain this from the perspective of Walmart? How are you thinking about the not random and nor rare, but the actually happening way too often um, in areas that we could predict, either hurricane areas or, or places where we're worried about, you know, sea, well, sea rising. Sure, and earlier you said random and rare, uh, and I think that, you, and we talked about adaptability and, and, and other elements, but um, it's, it's being able to have a framework to deal with the variables, right? And that's what it is. Um, for me, though, a, a lot of this comes back to communication, right? There needs to be a conversation. It's not just us on the stage. Like we talked about, Brad and I talked here recently about how are you doing things at Red Cross and how are you doing things at Walmart, but developing this mutual understanding of what it actually means to be a, a, a private sector participant um, and not have assumptions, whether it's on the part of the government or NGOs or each other, or my assumptions of what the Red Cross does, but to break those down long before those disasters ever get there so that we get faster, uh, more efficient at how we deal, how we communicate, how we share data, how we flow resources, whose roles are what. Um, we're, we're not a, a government entity. Uh, we're a, pr a private sector entity. We're a for-profit entity. Um, but we have you know, capability and we have expertise and we have things that we can lend to the communities. Um, if we continue at the pace that we're continuing, we'll, we'll continue to see these frequently. <laughs> and we'll continue to support our communities. Our, our job too, I think, um, in the place that we are is to be a convener. Um, and that's across the private sector because there's other people that haven't been activated yet that can be. Yeah. Um, and we talk to our counterparts and our competitors often about what they're doing and how we do it better. And, and it's really about making sure that the community is there at the end of the day um, and that they're supported and that they recover um, and not just leaving them to their own. Brad, what are, how is the Red Cross thinking about doing things differently after 2017, given, given what you all experienced through hurricane, 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 fire, and mudslides, and everything else? So I think the, the, the big, there are a number of changes we're, we're obviously making internally. One of the most significant changes from our perspective is we've got to overhaul our supply chain and logistics systems. And I realize that doesn't sound sexy. That is not nearly as sexy as going in and, and, and doing some of these very other cool things that are going on. But I've got to tell you something. There are 60,000 home fires in the United States every single year. There's one going on right now probably in this community, and there are Red Cross people who are responding to it. And they're either going to open a shelter or they're going to feed people. Or they're going to give you a blanket. Or they're going to give you stuff that happens every night. And so we've got to get, frankly, we've got to get better at that. People say to me, I, I hear the ProPublica stuff, right? I, I'm, I'm not, I do read the newspapers occasionally, <laughs> right? Listen. If you're not out there playing, you probably aren't going to take a hit. If you're going to get on the field, if you watch the Super Bowl this past weekend, you're, you, better, you better have your body armor on because you're going to take a hit. That's part of what we have to do. But as the Secretary said, you've got to learn from that. Probably the biggest p learning I'm taking away is it's, it's, uh, it's your Red Cross. It's your Salvation Army. It's our Southern Baptists, right? We're the peop we are the people who make up those organizations. We are chefs volunteers. So if we're not going to step up as individuals, then I don't think anybody should be expecting that the government's going to solve all our problems for us. And that's not a political statement, that's a reality. And so my, my, my big change, we are really trying to mobilize the community. How can we change the face of Red Cross volunteers? You know what, we need to look at the communities we serve. We do. We are fortunate mm -hmm. to have volunteers in Puerto Rico who are from the island, fortunate to have volunteers in Virgin Islands who are from the island. We had to bring lots of other people in to do that but we really, really need to build more capacity in our communities. And the beauty of that is that we're the capacity, right? Every one of us, just a chef has done, can make a difference. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in California, uh, World Central Kitchen and Red Cross, I mean, remember, they are Goliath uh, and we're David. Mm. <laughs> and David doesn't want to bring down Goliath. <laughs> David only wants to get the respect. <laughs> <laughs> I respect uh, you, Of Jeff. Goliath, <laughs> right? But uh, in California, it was great. They, we, we, Red Cross opened seven shelters. So you saw how the great men and women of Red Cross, how quick, fast, activate how much love they give to every single American that comes into those shelters. And 
Uh, we went there, I don't know, because we were in the frenzy of Puerto Rico, and then we saw the fires in California. It's like, let's go. We began in LA cooking. The fires kept moving north. And what do we do? We began in, in a kitchen. I, I was the founding chairman called LA Kitchen. We are in the, in the process of feeding 20, 25,000 uh, veterans and elderly a day, funded by Robert Egger, my, my great hero. We began cooking there, Nate Mook, who also was with me, the first guy with me in, in Puerto Rico. The fire kept moving north, and what we did is we began moving north. And then we had opening a kitchen in the mission of uh, Buenaventura, in Ventura. And one of the missions funded by the Spaniards, some from Spain, I almost began crying, I cannot believe. <laughs> I opened 21, uh, we opened 21 kitchens in Puerto Rico, it's 21 missions, so it's like, oh my God, this is a symbol. Uh, you, if you are not a believer, you become a believer. <laughs> so we, we had great partnership there. Uh, and they gave us a lot of respect and we did the best we could, which is cooking the best meals we can. And we got great chefs, believe me, we're not gonna be able to beat those meals ever again. The firefighters were <laughs> happy, the people in the shelters were happy. <coughs> but then we're gonna have to be learning in, in, in the other areas that, you know, for me, mm -hmm. Uh, the men and women of Red Cross in Puerto Rico, they, they all did uh, the best they could under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. But me, as, as Red Cross, because I spoke with Gail uh, through email before speaking with you, I was let down in the sense of mm -hmm. if Red Cross, mm -hmm. uh, it's the, which is a big task, mm -hmm. is in charge, or we believe is in charge, of feeding if something happens, we need to think out of the box. So when I was reaching to everybody, was to say, okay guys, I don't know how this thing works, I don't know your business, I only know the business of cooking. Mm. But I have a feeling we have to feed millions of people and we need few things. I need help with fuel, help with diesel, and help with money. Because at the beginning, Nate and I, American Express, no more. <laughs> then, <laughs> then I open a line of credit, Line of credit, Jose, line of credit is half a million. Who is going to pay for it? Half a what? Half a million. Okay, don't worry. I call my CEO, uh, line of credit, uh, bigger. Uh, that's the way we did it. And we shouldn't be doing it this way when you read today that the federal government is negotiating a $150 million contract somewhere in the middle of Atlanta. Imagine if we did the same, simple, with the help of FEMA, Red Cross, or whatever else, and help uh, an NGO, we are a 501c3, so it's not like uh, we're gonna make any money. And if we make money, it's to keep reinvesting in the community, mm -hmm. if you understand what I mean. And on paper, we were supposed to do it faster, quicker. That's what I mean about adaptation. I do believe we're gonna all together, private sector, government, to have this unit of adaptation mm -hmm. that works. You, you know, uh, when you watch uh, Independence Day, mm -hmm. or, or <laughs> Yeah. That all of a sudden the guy that is not supposed to be there is there to save humanity or all those guys, no? We're going to need sometimes these kind of people that comes from the outside and is able to see something that others are not able to mm -hmm. see and activate resources that the normal procedure is not able to allow. And this is what we're going to have to be working. World Central Kitchen, we did our little part. There was plenty of people doing great work. But I know we, we, we generated the, 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 the best thing we did was this. Few weeks after, everybody began cooking. Mm -hmm. Every single school around Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. after a meeting with the Secretary of Education, we filmed a video. And she gave me powers, which I don't know if they are true or not, to <laughs> tell everybody, <laughs> if you're seeing this message, the Secretary is empowering you to activate the kitchen in your school, buy food, pay your workers, and start delivering food to the people in need in your community. Guess what? Every single school we began going, Vieques, Culebra, anywhere around the island, we will find teachers and cooks that they activated their kitchens at the request of the secretary. This was thinking out of the box. Why? Because the problem was big, mm. the problem was broad. Nobody could anticipate the big mess that Puerto Rico became, as the secretary said, and we needed to be thinking out of the box. That's what we need to be uh, trying to do more. I think on that note, I want to give students and others an opportunity to ask questions of the panel. So if you could uh, come to the microphones um, and ask any questions. I have some of my students here. Don't you have questions? Um, and introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi. So many people. 
Yeah. Okay, come a little closer to the microphone. Oh. There you go. Closer. Hi. Closer. Hi. I'm Andrea Quinones. Thank you. I'm a medical student and a, a student at the School of Public Health. Oh, great. Um, my question is actually for each one of the panelists. Um, we've heard several stories about um, logistics and bureaucracies um, getting in the way of help getting to people in Puerto Rico. Just wondering if you think FEMA has a fundamental flaw or a flaw in its structure that prevents it from anticipating um, needs, as the secretary had mentioned before, um, or innovating or bypassing the different ways that things are usually done. Um, just wondering what your thoughts on are how FEMA are structured and why it might have been limited in bypassing the traditional ways of helping. Well, I'll begin. Um, <clears throat> Puerto Rico is an outlier. Mm. Puerto Rico was uh, uh, was terrible in a number of ways. In general, I, in my observation, was very impressed with FEMA's ability to mobilize resources and anticipate the need for them very quickly. Um, a situation in South Carolina a couple of years ago with uh, a lot of ice, severe snowstorms in the winter, FEMA had mobilized several hundred thousand meals and bottles of water in anticipation of the event and ended up not needing a fraction of it. And so I've been impressed with their agility and ability to put things together and anticipate very happen, very quickly. As I said, Puerto Rico came on the heels of other natural disasters, which no doubt stretched everybody's resources. And the issue with the contractor that was mentioned was the, the contractors that FEMA normally goes to for food supply and so forth were already stretched in yeah. Texas and in Florida, so they ended up going to one that they had not worked with before, and that turned into a real mess. So, so I'll jump in here too, uh, just from a pri the private sector side, because I can tell you there was nothing more frustrating than not being able to move freight. Um, and, and it, but I think that, that back to the outlier side of it, it, it also presented some challenges that we hadn't had before. Besides mm -hmm. electricity that we talked about and water utility, communication. And to me, communication mm -hmm. was, was the biggest issue in Puerto Rico. Um, with all of the cell towers down for a period of time, no landlines or anything, you're relying on satellite phones and just maybe a, a little bit of here or there communication out in the early weeks, right? In the early week. Um, and that just completely exacerbated everything, right? It, it, slow communication, is, is information accurate or is it not accurate? And so it made everything move very slowly. Plus then you had damage to both the airports and seaports, uh, which also then slowed everything down. And so um, I think the learning for us and that the, we're having the conversations with our partners at, at FEMA and, and, and with the state um, is, or with the territory, is really um, around um, how do we do this better in the future? Um, what were the lessons that we learned out of this and how can we flow things faster through the port, knowing that the government is gonna surge in, the private sector is gonna surge in, NGOs are gonna surge in, all through that one port, or, or through, for us, one port that was closed down for an extra period of time with ships already on the water to get there. Um, so those were some of the biggest challenges, but we have to learn to adapt. Uh, at the end of the day, and I know we, we as our company, were doing everything we legally could to try to get bo new boats to the island, um, f uh, air freight to the island, uh, or whatever it took, uh, but we're just going to have to think differently. Yes, uh, to directly answer your question, I think I have an ethical obligation to disclose I'm the former chief counsel of FEMA. So, <laughs> um, so but that, I say that because I, I, I want you to understand that the answer I'm about to give you is not an uninformed answer. Um, I think there's a civics lesson, and I'm just being upfront, that I think Americans have to absorb. And it goes to Chef's point about special teams. If you want to block and tackle, you don't call the kicking team on the field. If you, need to, if you need to pass the ball, then you get the offense out and you do that. FEMA does two things by law. It writes checks and it coordinates. It has very few other directive authorities. And by the way, if it wasn't writing checks, no one would show up for the coordination. Um, and so understanding that is important to understanding that other people in the community, mm -hmm. the broader community, have roles to play. Chef said it very well earlier. If you see something that needs to be done, do it. Mm -hmm. So to the adaptive point real quick, I don't think FEMA has a fundamental flaw that prevents it from adapting. I think it has a role to play. 
and I think it played that role. And nobody should lose sight of the fact that um, uh, the work that FEMA did, and I could care less what administration it is, that's, that's irrelevant to me. The work that FEMA did in these disasters over the last seven months is simply extraordinary. The question is, was it good enough? Well, it may, it, I don't have a good answer for that. I think FEMA did absolutely the best that it could do under the circumstances. The question is, how can we all do better next time? That's where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to disagree only to make it more fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I like that. Um, the people, every one of the men and women of FEMA, uh, and I've seen it with my own eyes, uh, I only can give them but a 10 and applaud to them because they were beyond the hours of duty. They really care, mm -hmm. and you can see in their eyes uh, uh, what goes through them uh, when they see that they cannot do more sometimes. But they do believe FEMA has flaws. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the few. I'm going to tell you one. Uh, well, they kicked me out of FEMA building one day because I will come illegally, undocumented, through the back door kitchen. But <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait to have a FEMA card. I'm not going to lie to you. So because nobody was able to get me uh, a card, even we were doing in the north of three million meals, I had to find creative ways to go to speak to the people. I wanted to talk to the general. To, uh, what are you doing here? I have an idea. So one flaw. Somebody at night, like it was a Kubi Rubik, will move everything in the space. <laughs> and who was over here, he moved to the second floor. Who was over there, he moved over there. The people over here, they moved them up there. Only that for me was like, what's going on? <laughs> well, they're doing it to make it more efficient. Like, thank you very much. So, <laughs> I'm sure it's a reason behind it. But this to me, I couldn't believe it. One other flaw, I think is way, everybody complained that America, didn't send enough people. Uh, I believe in, in, I don't believe in big government. Uh, I, I believe in the right government. I think we can do more with less. So many people, so many people that look like, you know, Babylon. It looks mm. like nobody understands anymore who is in charge of certain things. And everybody's looking for everybody and sometimes some people are, are, are your wedding. But let me tell you a very quick story. We were a foot organization. We produce and we deliver. Uh, some days we were delivering in the north of five, six hundred different delivery points all around the 78 municipalities. So we became very computer, Google Maps organized. We knew who was producing where and who was receiving the food and who was delivering. We became like very techy, if you want. In the process, we got a lot of intelligence in terms of medicines. We would learn people that needed medicine. And we know our role, but then we knew the doctors, and we knew some hospitals. So one doctor requested medicine for post-transplant medicine, post-transplant, pancreas. So he was the only doctor in the whole Caribbean doing transplants. He came to the hotel. Again, the hotel is a great place. <laughs> and he said, Jose, I need this. I requested it to different organizations. I'm still waiting, and I'm afraid that people are going to die or I cannot keep doing more operations. I call Paul Farmer, partners mm. in health. I call George Washington University, lucky that I'm from there. Within three days, we were able to get those medicines and give it to the doctor. Mm. And the doctor could keep doing transplants and make sure that the transplants he did, people will not die. What's the lesson learned? This will be great for FEMA, Red Cross, maybe Walmart, maybe Google. I've been talking to them. I cannot believe that to this day, you go to a shelter, you go to a hunger uh, somewhere in Puerto Rico, and it's enough Advil and enough for the next 100 million years for Puerto mm. Rico. Mm. At the end, cannot we have mm. a simple app program that in these catastrophes, the key hospitals can say, this is what we need. And then the same program that the givers that want to do good say, this is what we want to help you with. And we match. Mm. And in this very simple way, givers and receivers are united. Something like this didn't exist. Every hospital you will go, they will have problems of too much of what they didn't need and nothing of what they really needed. So even things like this, I don't see so complicated as a simple program that should be in place for this type of mm. emergencies. I ask around because I got very interested. And as far as I know, that type of program doesn't exist. 
maybe you guys should start working on that and pass <laughs> it to FEMA, pass it to Red Cross, and all of a sudden, a simple problem becomes a huge opportunity. We don't need to fill up the port with Advil nobody needs anymore. And then we can do with Walmart a program, like it was Matrix, that then you see what the needs of the island are, how much space we need in the port for electric towers, if they are priority, how much space we need for water and food, how much we need for medicines, and you don't allow more of anything coming, so health starts getting in in the right way. When we start thinking that we need to feed an entire island, mm. the problem is impossible. If you start feeding 1,000 people at the time, all of a sudden it's doable. Mm. But from 1,000 you go to 10, mm. from 10 you go to 100, and from 100 you make it a million. We need to start not thinking so big, but thinking slightly smaller and continuously. And many of the problems, they find the solution on their own if you, you keep doing it. Thank you. I'm going to go over here. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is uh, Taz Islam, and I'm a research assistant reports. in the Belfort Center and also a grad student here. Uh, my question is, Every day when I go to a grocery store, a mega grocery store like Walmart or Star Market or anything like that, I see after a certain time, enormous number of food is being wasted. They just throw it away. Nobody's allowed to touch it. It has to go to the trash. Uh, nobody's even allowed to like, you know, eat it. Um, what, are the, what are the incentives or what are the obstacles? What is uh, holding the companies, big companies like Walmart to reduce those ways and having the money allocate to somewhere like Red Cross. What are the obstacles that they're facing and what are the situations that uh, Red Cross, the, um, the agencies that are receiving those funds, are pressuring um, corporate to get those funds and try to find some kind of solution? Is it supply chain? Is it just logistical? Is it in the system? Where is the, where is the problem? Is it from the FDA? Um, that's the question to everyone, and my specific question to Mr. Um, Jose uh, uh, Andres is um, the same chicken wing that I cannot eat after, let's say, uh, 9 p.m. here um, that has to go to the trash. Would you follow the same thing when you're actually feeding thousands of people in an island? You want. So uh, in those kind of situation, um, you're not going to waste the food. You're definitely going to yeah. use it. Uh, for the people in need, and um, why this bystander? Okay, so let me, thank you, thank you. So let me just start, uh, the question is sort of the standards that we have for food uh, and food safety and security. One is should we yeah. change them be in a crisis? Uh, the other is, you know, it seems like a lot of waste. So I mean, let's start with you, but then also yeah. how you think about it, because you don't want to get people sick in the middle of a crisis. Sure, and, and so there's always regulations, right? Um, and, and let me let me go to the food really quick. Um, I can't speak for other supermarkets mm -hmm. or, or, or other companies. I know that we've really engaged in a feed the feeding program, um, donating a lot of those those products that are that are getting close to date or, or such uh, to local sh um, food banks, right? So that they can use it locally. Uh, the key there, especially for perishable product, is making sure it's getting to somebody that can use it in the time that the food is still mm -hmm. good, right? And that and that's the goal. Um, kind of bigger picture back to um, there, there are regulations that, that we have to follow to make sure that the food that we're giving to people is safe. Uh, but for me, I think it's mobilization, right, which is a disaster creates a surge. Um, and we have to be able to surge products um, as efficiently and effectively as possible to whatever community that needs it. And so for us, usually flowing either from our vendors straight or flowing from our distribution centers, I mean, we're taking truckloads of things and not going back out and collecting it necessarily from each of the stores, but pushing it as fast as we can. There are Go, go. No, please. No, 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 no. no, please. You're the expert. No, please. I'm not the expert in this. Please. All right. I'll go quick. <laughs> Did you yeah, see yeah, your yeah, titles? Yeah, yeah, you yeah, got no, more no, titles no. than so, me. So I, I think one is understanding there's lots of different ways to feed. Um, they're not infinite, but there's different ways. Yeah. Uh, Red Cross did 7 million meals, and we're still feeding in Puerto Rico. Um, there are at least 60 communities right now that do not have sustainable food. We talked earlier about common sense. Listen, people came back and said, hey, the grocery stores are open. We're done. And we sent people in and said, look on the shelves. Turns out there's no food. You want all the toilet paper you can get, um, but no food. 
So part of it is, are, we, are you catering meals? Are you relying on the local economy and helping to build the restaurateurs and the vendors up doing that? Are you bringing in shelf-stable meals because there's no way to cook? Are you delivering produce and canned goods? So there's, there's a lot of different layers to the solution. The problem we often face in shelters is people come in, and I'm not talking about small scale, they come in with home-cooked food and they want to give that out. I have thousands of people in a shelter. I have no idea how that food was prepared. So when we, when we distributed chef's food, right, there's a degree of reliability there. Not necessarily the case that you can count on when you have, uh, so it's a, it's a challenge. He has all the lady volunteers with the thermometer, putting the thermometer in, in the there, they're checking it. And I'm looking at them like, it. are you kidding me? Right. Are you kidding me? But they, they take it seriously. We did to, I mean, imagine, yeah. I have to deliver 175,000 meals a day at one point, and we did that for a few days. 175,000. I needed cameras, uh, yeah. which we then got them from yeah. Homeland. Mm -hmm. uh, late, they came very late, very late. Okay. Which are plastic, big, that you put a big plastic bag inside, you fill it up with mashed mm -hmm. potato, then you do another one, you fill it up with uh, meat, uh, gravy, like it was bolognese, yeah? And then keeps very, very hot, and then you can put it in the helicopter, and you can throw it from the helicopter, and nothing happens and you can deliver the food very hot, very safe. Um, uh, so we put a lot of, uh, in the menus we did, we did six different menus because mm -hmm. I wanted the people to receive different communities, different meals every day. And then we began making some vegetarian and then we got some people that they had issues with pork because religion. And then we had some people that were celiacs and I'm like, great, like my restaurants. Uh, but we began kind of accommodating, especially in hospitals as much as we, uh, as, uh, 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 as we could. But in, 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 in your question about waste, f listen, uh, chefs we know. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a father before a chef, okay? And, and I, I will not serve others while I will not serve my yeah. daughters. It's, it's what I always think. So uh, I was, uh, a, a very important moment in my life, I was 25 and I was with Secretary Glickman when they, they passed what they call in a very friendly way, the law of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan mm -hmm. law. There was a law that was protecting individuals or businesses that they were giving food in good faith to don't be sued if something happened. So I was there the first day that the law passed. Secretary Glickman came with a truck. We gave food from my restaurant into the truck and was kind of... So it's things like this in place. But again, no Walmart, no Red Cross, no Wall Central Kitchen uh, will, 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 you know, will always use good judgment. So if you're telling me if the yogurt says is expired, but I feel it's really good, me, I may make the call to use it. Uh, why? Because I've eaten my, all my life yogurts that they were a week and two weeks old and look at how beautiful I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but I, I understand why these certain inspirations. But again, I will, every day in Puerto Rico in this case, I always said I will serve this food to my daughters. And the answer was always mm -hmm. yes. So we, 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 we kept serving. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. I'm looking at a clock and I'm Thank getting the, yes. So I want to, first of all, uh, Secretary, Brad, Jason, and Chef, I want to thank you all, uh, first of all, and have the audience thank you for a tremendous discussion about what's ahead. We only touched on a little bit of um, what we wanted to, but I also don't want all of you to leave. Uh, uh, these are all four wonderful men, but they do not have superpowers. They are like you. And so to the extent that uh, the future of disasters in the United States uh, depends on our communities, I'm going to get a shout out to the Massachusetts Red Cross team over there. Sign up with them. Uh, give blood. Do what you can. Um, because uh, they don't have superpowers either. And they we just have FEMA need, right here. And FEMA's over here. Regional so fantastic. <laughs> Yay. So these are people who need your help. So uh, the next time you're sitting at your TV complaining about why things aren't working better in a disaster, ask yourself why you aren't out there. So thank you all very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.